Rustam and Semyon are going to talk about the RTM botnet. So it's not read the manual or something like that. It's <laughs> you have the floor. Is Thank there a chance I can use your microphone? Uh, so you're, you're it's in the office. We have, we have here, by the way. Okay. So, um, hello. Hello and good morning, everyone. Um, today, we'll talk about RTM botnet. It's uh, quite old nowadays. And uh, we'll tell you how we shut down uh, this botnet how we sync hold it first. And um, this talk will sound weird for you nowadays because uh, the situation changed crazy. Actually, this case started in 2019 for me. And uh, it's about how the collaboration between five different countries, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Singapore, Germany and Bulgaria helped to uh, collect enough evidences to arrest the main developer and the main leader of uh, behind this uh, botnet. And um, firstly, I thought about changing the topic, but I decided, okay, it's still important to show how uh, this collaboration between law enforcement agencies uh, help people to protect against uh, and fight against cybercrime. A few words about us. So my name is uh, Rustam Mirkasimov. Uh, I joined Group IB eight years ago, and uh, I'm, I, I started as malware analyst uh, in threat intelligence department, and uh, my responsibility is to track uh, cybercrime and state-sponsored hacking groups. And my name is Semyon Rogachev. I have joined Group IB for more than four years ago. Uh, I have started as a malware analyst and currently I'm also an incident responder, but I'm still extremely interested in the reverse engineering. So let's start the topic. Yeah, and um, I, I want to make some uh, history introduction. So um, it's, it's not a secret that uh, Russian speaking countries uh, is the main exporter of uh, cybercrime and uh, uh, banking Trojans to uh, Europe and uh, Western world. Um, since in 2008, Zeus uh, made a revolution in uh, banking Trojans. And uh, in since 2008 to I think 2016 or 17, most of uh, hacking groups which attack financial organizations and uh, banks were Russian speaking. And uh, their tactic is that they start to test their tools, their Trojans in, uh, in their homelands like Russia, Ukraine, Republic of Kazakhstan and uh, other former Soviet Union countries, and then they uh, start to attack uh, organizations in uh, Europe and United States. So, um, and interestingly, that uh, some of hacking groups here, like Anonac, Corco, when one ends, I mean, when we register that uh, some group uh, stop their operations, another immediately starts. So uh, it is not a secret that even nowadays uh, these uh, people, in, I mean members of those hacking groups, they change, uh, they change uh, their groups like uh, they leave one, they enter uh, other groups and uh, you can't say, okay, this, uh, these affiliates work only with uh, this ransomware group. So it's a continuous process and some people participate in different groups and so on. And um, I think the best example of that uh, is uh, uh, born of Cobalt Group. So uh, when Ananak or Carbonac, as uh, some of you, call them, uh, stop their operation. Some, uh, 
some, peop some members of this group were arrested. Uh, other teammates who, who were able to remain, to remain unpunished, they moved uh, their operations to other locations, other regions, and uh, founded such groups like Fin7, uh, Cobalt, Bochtra, and others. And um, the story about a guy, let's name him Fox. Uh, it is not that Fox in Telegram channel, some of you know him, <laughs> another Fox. <laughs> um, uh, so I think in 2015 or 14, uh, Russian, Russian police uh, investigated uh, Anunnak attacks and uh, one of the guys there, uh, he was just an operator and uh, he made some uh, lateral movement uh, in a targeted organization and to do that he used a VPN. Uh, which was stolen from that organization. And uh, in the end of his working day, he forgot to uh, switch off his VPN and order pizza to his house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, Destiny gave him a chance. Uh, law enforcement was able to collect enough evidences, so uh, he, he just received a probation period and what do you think he started to do? So since the group was disbanded, he decided, okay, now I know a lot, a lot about uh, hacking attacks. And he decided to write his own botnet and make new group. And this is how RTM was made. So, uh, to make a little bit more familiar with the RTM, let's start from the basic attack overview. So, uh, the first uh, stage is the uh, initial access establishing stage. Uh, it was made by the RTM via the two different ways. The first way is pretty common, it's a spear phishing. Uh, it, ca it was done by bo uh, from both uh, compromised emails or fake emails. Uh, they especially frequently used uh, fake emails of different uh, government um, services in Russia, especially re regional ones, uh, since uh, a lot of uh, services, uh, government services in regions in Russia don't use DKIM, SPF, DMARC, something like that. Uh, not all of these phishing emails were blocked. At the same time, there was another way to establish an initial access, and it was a way via the compromised websites for financial specialists. Just for example, after the initial, uh, after the financial site is compromised, some exploit back with the payload is uploaded to it, and as soon as a vulnerable victim goes to the site, it receives a payload. Um, in our investigated cases, the payload was a reconnaissance module, uh, which in different cases either uploaded to the uh, host or to the infected host or book trap, which is once again extremely uh, famous um, attack group uh, on the territory of the ex USSR or the RTM modules. So uh, after the initial after the host is compromised, the RTM recon module uh, is started. So RTM recon module is a pretty basic thing which doesn't conduct any malicious activity. It simply checks if this exact host is related to some kind of financial activity of the company. Uh, depending, on the, um, depending on the results, like after the check, uh, it either uh, uh, downloads the RTM core with different modules, which allows to, con uh, to, pro uh, to conduct the full attack and to withdraw the money. Or it simply downloads the Pony Stealer, for example, uh, which also allows to harvest some credentials, but still it doesn't lead to some kind of a money stealing or something like that. So let's move on. Uh, let's start from discussing of the first stage. Uh, the first stage is obviously reconnaissance, and it actually uh, contains two different steps. The first step is to check browser history for the presence of different uh, financial banking organization in history, etc., etc. Um, 
I believe there were like 20 or even more banks listed in all the indicators. But on the screen you can see like uh, six most, uh, most famous of them. Uh, probably VTB and Alpha Bank are not, are not known for you, but it's uh, quite big banks in Russia. Uh, also, I believe you have heard about the Sberbank, about the Raiffeisen, Western Union, blockchain. So RTM operators are also interested in the cryptocurrency. As you can see, blockchain is listed right here. Uh, so the first stage is to check uh, the presence of these indicators uh, in the browser history. Thank you. The second stage is to check the file system. The file system is checked for the presence for, uh, of about 15 different, uh, 15 different banking services. Um, at the same time, once again, I believe I have listed the most famous and the most interesting of them right here. Uh, the first one is ADNS. Uh, it's, uh, let me explain, uh, I believe some of you are familiar with the, such a thing as SAP, right? Uh, what, uh, ADNS is in fact pretty much the same thing which allows an accountant to pay the taxes, to pay the salaries, to calculate the holidays of the employees, etc, etc. So it is extremely, extremely popular, I would even say it's the only thing which is used on the territory of the ex-USSR countries to do this kind of an activity. And of course, there are another different uh, software which is also related to the banks, to the crypto wallets, and so on and so on. So after the first stage uh, uh, reconnaissance is finished, the recon module uh, sends a HTTP GET request to its command and control server. And uh, depending on if some of the indicators were found or not, were found or not uh, he modifies the, uh, the request parameter and the command and control server either returns the RTM core with modules or returns the simple pony stealer. So the second stage is a core module. Uh, the list of the modules are presented on the screen right now. Uh, if you are interested in some kind of a deep understanding of what, what these modules actually do, you can find the reports of the ESET team, of our team, or I believe Bizon also have made the research of this thing. Uh, long story short, it allows uh, uh, an RTM operator to fully control the remote host which is infected with the RTM. Capabilities are pretty common for this kind of malware. Uh, this is the ending of the previous slide. Uh, as you can see, it also allows to do the DBO scan, which is pretty much the same thing which is made by the reconnaissance module. So once again, nothing extremely unusual in the capabilities of this uh, malware. Uh, the third stage is about the running the modules. The modules, in fact, allow to do the credential harvesting via the different way, uh, in the different ways to do the network scanning via the IRP uh, requests, uh, something like that, via the um, Active Directory scanning, and so on and so on. So these modules, of course, uh, extend the capabilities of the RTMM, but once again, if you can list, if you can check them and you can see them, uh, nothing extremely unusual is presented right here. So RTM is, has a pretty common capabilities, nothing extremely suspicious. So after right now, uh, uh, since now we know uh, how the attacks actually made, let's discuss the last stage of the attack, uh, an impact stage. Um, so uh, as I've already said, uh, the most of the RTM attacks led to the money withdrawal. Uh, and these are the things which are made via the RDP or team viewer or, or via the 1S2KL module. So uh, RDM or team viewer, well, pretty basic thing. Uh, RTM simply uploaded the hidden, ver uh, the modified version of the TeamViewer. TeamViewer is an extremely popular remote access tool in Russia and uh, ex-USSR countries. Um, so via the TeamViewer, uh, an RTM operator simply could connect to the remote host and uh, simply create a, a payment, a payment or something like that to withdraw the money. Uh, also, the RDP was used for the same purpose, so nothing suspicious or nothing unusual right here. One S2KL module, which was frequently used previously, but in the latest attacks, RTM usually uses a TeamViewer modified version. So one S2KL is uh, based, once again, on the software, which is called 1S, which I have already mentioned. 
uh, it injects to its process, and there is a specific file, which is 1s2kl, and this file actually contains all the payments data which should be done by this program. In fact, after an attacker hooks all the functions which are responsible for writing data to this exact module, to this exact TXT file, it has a full control of the payment services of the company, and this full control is invisible for, for an accountant. Like, for example, he types into the field an absolutely correct uh, account number or something like that, but at the same time, since the hook is invisible for, for an accountant, uh, the data is modified and the transaction data is, uh, is changed. Also, uh, we have seen how RTM operators uh, uh, deploy the ransomware, and this is a pretty funny thing because hype train goes to two. Uh, ransomware was deployed several times via the IT RTM. This is not a thing that we expected, but still, uh, nowadays it looks like every single person tries to uh, deploy ransomware. Uh, so now let's get closer to the fact that allowed us to hijack the malware. Uh, the RTM operators, uh, RTM developers, never used common ways to obtain uh, an IP address of the remote, uh, of the command and control server. Uh, the first approach with which they have used was related to the uh, live journal. You can see the screen right now. Um, live journal uh, is uh, one of the oldest, I believe, one of the oldest uh, social networks on the territory of the ex-USSR countries. So basically, on the screen, you can see one of the posts, uh, which are made by the uh, RTM operators. And as you can see, there is, a, a 40, uh, there is an opening and closing brackets with the number 40 inside of it. It's an indicator of the, um, it's indicator of the RTM group. And between these brackets, you can see uh, the encrypted data about which server should be used as a remote com command and control server in this case. Uh, afterwards, they have evolved to usage of the .bit domains. Uh, .bit domains are specific DNS uh, domains uh, which use uh, name coin technology, and uh, it allowed them to uh, to to be protected from uh, and delegation of the DNS, uh, DNS entries. Um, and the third stage, which they have used, and it was the last one, and there was a huge mistake in this thing, uh, they decided to leverage the Bitcoin technology even more, and they have, tr uh, have started to use the Bitcoin-based algorithm. So the Bitcoin-based algorithm uh, contained three steps. The first step is to obtain an information about the transactions of exact wallet from the block cipher API. Uh, it, that's the first step. The second step is to uh, obtain an information about last two transactions, uh, calculate the value of it, and transform it to the command and control address. I will show you an example for a better understanding a little bit later. But there was a huge mistake made by the RTM developers. They haven't checked uh, what, which wallet the transaction came from. It means that, in fact, every single person which has enough, block, uh, which has enough, which has enough uh, Bitcoin is able to change the address of the command and control server of the RTM. So here's the example. Uh, this information, uh, which you can see on the left part of the screen, is, uh, is just a JSON, which is returned by the Block Cipher API. Uh, and right here, I want you to pay your attention to the value field. Value, in fact, is amount of money which is transferred. And RTM takes two last transaction data to obtain the command and control server. As you can see, we have the transaction number 53, and its value is 35,431, right? So the first step which is made by the RTM executable is translation of this value to the hexadecimal number, which is two bytes, and it always is two bytes. They do these kind of transactions. As you can see, it's 8A67. And afterwards, uh, after that, since it's a little endian, um, uh, the sequence of uh, bytes is changed, and 67 goes to 103. And 8A goes to the 138. If some of you have a calculator, I believe we can check this. Uh, this is the first transaction data, and the second transaction data is done is preceded via the same way. 
but in this case, we have 91 and 200 numbers. So the second transaction data is the first two octets of the IP address of the remote uh, command and control server. And the value of the first transaction is two last octets. So this algorithm gives us an opportunity to calculate the remote command and control server address. So once again, we have this algorithm and we have an understanding after reverse engineering of the samples that no additional validation is made. This is an important thing. Um, you can do exactly the same uh, calculations uh, from the block cipher API, like here's a little bit better human readable thing, like you can see that the value is uh, 35,431 and 51,291. It, leads, uh, it gives us another IP address. And these IP addresses, according to our research, are changed like two, once in a two or three days. In some of the cases, it happens more frequently, but still. This is an example from the 5th December of, uh, of 2019, I believe. So uh, after, after I received this uh, report, uh, malware engineering report, uh, reverse engineering report from Simeon, I decided, okay, first of all, we can uh, track in real time all uh, new command and control service used by RTM botnet. So um, I wrote simple uh, Python snippet to, to um, collect those IP addresses and uh, put them into our system and uh, we provided them to our customers so they were able to um, to put these IPs into their defending uh, solutions uh, even before those samples uh, has been delivered to to them and uh, another thing uh, one one of of uh, those servers uh, was located in Singapore. So um, with help of my colleagues uh, who work with uh, Interpol, we reached out uh, to Singaporean police and uh, seized the server. Uh, the same was done with another server in Bulgaria. And uh, on both servers, we found that both of them were used as just a proxy service and they redirect traffic to uh, exactly the same IP address, 91.200.103.39. And um, according, according to our graph, this server was uh, deployed like um, two, two years ago, so it seems like uh, in, in two years um, RTM gang didn't uh, change the real backend, so they only they only change uh, the proxy front ends. And uh, this server was located in Germany, and uh, so we started to think how we can uh, how we can make this process clear. Uh, because uh, according to uh, German legislation, it is quite difficult to make such requests to them, so they, they can seize, but they cannot provide it back to us. Uh, I will explain later how we process that stuff. So we decided, okay, now uh, we know how to change uh, the how to change this uh, Bitcoin wallet, how to send transactions. So we wanted to sinkhole uh, the botnet to understand uh, how many compromised machines are there and uh, take measures to notify uh, big organizations. And uh, it's important here that uh, it was really important for us uh, not to make any uh, any direct uh, 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 interactions with uh, with those compromised machines. So we wanted just to redirect traffic to our server, sniff it, analyze, and uh, don't send any active commands or any traffic to to compromised machines. So. Uh, First, first issue we faced was uh, that uh, RTM used uh, quite 
old, uh, quite old wallets, and uh, we created a new SegWit BEC32 uh, Bitcoin wallet. And the problem with it was that uh, there is a limit, uh, a minimum amount of Bitcoins you can send uh, via one transaction. And uh, we rented a server with IP address uh, 5, Point two, point sixty-seven, point fifty, and to send uh, first octet, we had to send this uh, amount of uh, bitcoins. And with a new, new Segwit uh, wallets, it it wasn't possible. So happily, we did that uh, during testing attempt, and. Uh, also, it was important to determine the, the fee. So uh, if you s make your transaction with lower fee, it is possible that it will not uh, be sent to the target wallet in time. And uh, during, during, so we, we started to wait when the RTM operators will change their uh, command and control server to start immediately uh, our operation. And uh, unfortunately, when, when we started to do that, uh, we chose low fee, so it wasn't correct. And our transactions uh, were received by the wallet in wrong sequence. So our last octets uh, came first, and uh, it was a mess. But uh, luckily for us, RTM operators didn't notice anything. So they, issue, they published, they, they made a patch uh, in RTM Trojan just uh, after two days later. So we had a time to sinkhole, to, to fix our mistake and to uh, redirect traffic from all botnets to our own server. And uh, the analysis of, uh, of that showed that uh, we received a registration request from th more than uh, 3,000 hosts. Uh, six different languages were installed, so we analyzed registration uh, requests from compromised machines, and uh, there were uh, six different languages installed on those in the uh, in uncompromised machines. And uh, so overall, it took almost two years to collect evidences and to make this arrest. So I, I promised to tell how we, how we did this cooperation. We first, first we found a friend uh, who was close to German police. We asked him, to host uh, a meeting, a call. We, showed, we shared all our findings, but uh, according to strict laws, uh, they requested us, okay, we can't, we can't provide any data to you, but if you make uh, an MLAT request via, uh, fr from any police, we'll be able to, to provide this data back. So yeah, we, we're lack of time now. Uh, Finally, finally, German police uh, sent uh, all collected data back, and uh, the police was able to collect enough evidences and uh, arrest bad guys. Unfortunately, not all of them. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for uh, for listening to us. Unfortunately, I think we don't have time <laughs> for questions. Yeah, we have time for one question. You sure? <laughs> Great presentation. Um, do you know if this Fox guy was part of the bootstrap gang before? Yes. Because, yes. Okay. That's true. Uh, yeah, I made a mistake. Not Anonak, but bootstrap. You're right. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.